One of the paradoxes is that this is, in essence, a process of non-doing and of allowing what naturally wants to happen. But the reason the situation doesn't typically remedy itself on its own is because when it comes to chronic breathing tension or air hunger, our breathing and our relationship to it are already so far out of alignment that we need some external guidance to begin to recognize and restore that natural direction and movement. And this is where I want to provide some brief background on the Alexander Technique as we begin to discuss how to unwind our habitual interference and liberate the natural movement of the breath. F.M. Alexander lived from 1869 to 1955, and he was a stage actor in Australia. The basic version of the story is that as an actor performing Shakespeare and the like on stage, Alexander frequently lost his voice either during or soon after a performance. And this happened again and again. So he would go to various health practitioners and doctors seeking answers for the cause of his voice loss, which of course, interfered with his ability to perform as an actor, but no one could find anything wrong with him. Finally, out of exasperation, he said to a doctor treating him that if there was nothing medically wrong with him, then his voice loss must be caused by something that Alexander himself was doing. The doctor considered this and said, well, that sounds right, but if that's the case, I don't know what it is that you're doing that's causing the problem. And this launched Alexander into years of very methodical self-observation, discovering what that was. And just as an aside, I think it's kind of fun to note here that in 1973, the Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine, Nicholas Tinbergen, and he shared it with another researcher, he dedicated a significant portion of his Nobel Prize acceptance lecture to the Alexander Technique. And in that lecture, he called the Alexander Technique's development, one of the true epics of medical research and practice, and one that was based on exceptionally sophisticated observation. So those are his quotes. And I just think it's interesting to get a sense of the depth of Alexander's research from, from that perspective from Tim Birkin. Anyway, from that research epic, Alexander developed a whole understanding of the psychophysical self and its natural and optimal use, and how to cultivate or restore that use, that natural and optimal use. And he gave a lot of attention to breathing. He was even known in his time as the breathing man. This framework also incorporates a very powerful and sophisticated understanding of human habit, attention, and choice. So much so that one of the most celebrated philosophers of the 20th century, John Dewey, was a big proponent of Alexander's work and wrote introductions to his books. And Dewey said of the Alexander Technique, again, this is a quote, that it bears the same relation to education that education itself bears to all other human activities. So there's a little to ponder in there, but I think... Um, I think Dewey was recognizing in the Alexander Technique a kind of meta-learning framework and a deep understanding of how change and learning happen. So I want to summarize what I think are some of the powerful insights in Alexander's theory of change as I see it. It begins with the understanding that the muscular skeletal system, basically the body, naturally tends toward coherence coordination, and ease. And in most cases, it's perfectly balanced and evolved and adaptable. But for a variety of reasons, we develop habits that interfere with that inherent ease and coordination. And this results in discomfort or problems such as, for our purposes, breathing tension. If we could just allow this natural ease, we'd be fine but the problem is that our habits of interference are so ingrained and we're so unaware of them that any attempts to just be natural or to just relax result instead in our unknowingly playing out habits. 
Another insight is that we're usually unable to even sense the habits or to sense what is natural because our kinesthetic perception gets distorted over time by the habits. Furthermore, even when we do become aware of a habit, we often can't free ourselves from it because we'll inevitably try to do something to fix it. And our attempts to fix a habit, which are, as we said, informed by an already distorted sense of things, usually just create more interference on top of the initial interference. So then, of course, we arrive at this conundrum. If there's nothing we can do about our habits, are we simply doomed? But no, we're not doomed because we can recognize that the habits themselves are a doing. And the interference is something that we are doing. It takes some effort, even if it's become unconscious. And as we realize this, we restore our capacity for choice. And as we make that essential choice, which is to recognize the habit and give up the doing of the habit, we create the space for recognizing and following what naturally wants to happen. And one of Alexander's often quoted lines is, the right thing does itself. So this idea that as we release our own interference, we can align ourselves with the right thing that's already wanting to do itself. And my perspective is that this philosophy applies to many dimensions of life and not just breathing and not just our physical use. So this philosophy and other consonant philosophies inform a lot of my primary work with people, which is broadly in the fields of human development or psychology, or as I like to say, accompanying people on their initiatory journeys through life. So how does all this apply to breathing? Well, let's recap where we are. Earlier, we talked about the origins of air hunger and breathing tension. So remember, let's say we begin with unconscious natural breathing. Then some disruptive agent comes in and disrupts the natural breath or our accumulated habits eventually restrict the natural breath. And this can happen suddenly or gradually. Often the stress response or fight, flight, freeze response gets activated to some degree. Often we start chest breathing, which results in the restriction of the breathing mechanism because it usually tightens and restricts our ribs, our upper back, and our chest. And it gets us accustomed to an artificial sense of what a full breath feels like, which we then keep grasping at. This feeling of not being able to get enough breath is so troubling that we keep trying to cope with more effortful breathing, which is the only thing we know how to do, but this actually keeps the pattern and the tension in place and exacerbates it. And this brings us to the basic principles of how to undo this pattern. We find the natural involuntary breath by first learning to recognize our interference and release it, and second, by supporting the reawakening of the range of movement of the breath. And as we follow these two principles with the right support, so those two principles I just outlined, and we have the right support, I think there are three stages or breakthroughs that it's helpful to be aware of on our way to the natural breath. The first breakthrough involves unwinding the habit of reaching for air. So if you're experiencing that acute breathing tension habit of reaching for air with the upper chest, then this will likely be the first pattern you'll be addressing in your journey because it's the most disruptive habit and it largely prevents progress in the rest of the breathing mechanism. There's a lot that I could say about this process of breakthrough one of stage one. Um, it's not something we have the space to delve into in this video. I will go into it in much more detail in the other videos in the program that I'll mention later. It's also important to understand that nothing I'm saying should be interpreted as a suggestion to restrict anything in your body or to force yourself to do or not do anything. So nothing I'm saying should be heard that way. Instead, we're learning to use our growing awareness 
to see that you have choice around what you're already forcing yourself to do. And then we're learning to let go of that and allow the body to breathe. And in some ways, this first breakthrough I'm talking about is the most challenging breakthrough to navigate because it's so closely entwined with your instinctive sense of survival. But at the same time, it's also perhaps the most linear and least complicated breakthrough in the journey, and one that provides a significant amount of relief once it settles in. Moving through that pronounced habit in the first stage brings us to the second stage, where the breakthrough we're moving toward is restoring mobility. If you've been holding parts of your torso in a fixed state, so for example, if you've been locked up in your ribs and your chest, you will likely start to experience new mobility in these areas after you make it through that first breakthrough. And as you allow space and ease off different forms of interference, you'll notice restricted areas of your breathing gradually starting to open. And this is where we want to stay with this emerging mobility and let it guide us. And in the second stage, we become even more aware that interference is not just the over-breathing habits, like that reaching for air habit. Because interference also comes in the form of restriction of the natural movement of the breath. And both of these basic patterns are really strong forces that prevent the coordinated movement of the breath. And it's that coordinated movement that allows for a satisfying free breath. The third stage is where we really start experiencing the natural breath and the release of interference. This is where you've unwound enough tension and gained enough awareness around choice that your default becomes natural, uninterfered with breath. And then our world has been put right side up again because alignment now feels natural and easy. And movement away from alignment now feels uncomfortable and impaired, and that becomes very clear to us in stage three, but whereas before, in, earlier in stage one, for example, that distinction often feels very blurry to us and it's sometimes hard to tell which is which. So as we stay with the process of listening to the natural breath, we come to experience truly easeful, nourishing, liberated breathing. I want to end with a perspective on what I see as the invitation of this journey, this journey with air hunger, or chronic breathing tension. Because I know it can sometimes feel like a curse. But there's a way to embrace it that honors that it has a gift to give. And I know that sounds like a huge stretch when you're experiencing it, but if you embrace this experience as a teacher, there might be a lot to discover, and perhaps it may bring you into contact with newfound aliveness and freedom and awareness. And I thought I would close with a couple of quotes here. Um, and the first one is from F.M. Alexander himself. He said that people do not decide their futures. They decide their habits and their habits decide their futures. So I'm guessing that one is somewhat self-explanatory given all we've discussed around Alexander. This next quote is from the poet Rilke, and this is a sentence from one of his letters to a young poet. He wrote, All living things in nature must unfold in their particular way and become themselves at any cost and despite all opposition. And I think this captures something relevant because... I know that air hunger, when you're in it, can at times feel demoralizing and crushing, as if there's no way through. But the fullness of who you are is capable of finding its way beyond it. And you can trust that your system knows its way to the natural breath.